Well, my name is Meg Fenn. I'm one of the directors of Shake It Up Creative. We are a design and marketing company based here in Worthing. Uh, my business partner, Rachel Dines, is over there. Give away. Um, so we do a lot of collaborative stuff with Worthing Digital and also other local businesses too, which brings me to our venue for the day. Freedom Works is a co-working and flexible office space with locations in Hove, Chichester and Gatwick in addition to Worthing. So if you'd like to know more, if you want to arrange a tour, then please get in touch directly with them. Don O'Donnell is the manager of the Worthing Freedom Works and they would be happy to tell you more about it. So they kindly offered this space for us today and put on the teas and coffees and the um, light snacks. So if we could show an appreciate a uh, show of hands for um So let's get to the main event. As you all know, today is March 8th and people worldwide are celebrating International Women's Day with the theme be being Balanced for Better. The future is exciting, so let's build a gender balanced world because balance drives a better working world. We have three speakers today who are working hard to do just that. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Jenna Basto. Jenna is the creator of Prodpad, product management tool, and co-founder of Mind the Product Community. Thank you for joining us, Jenna. Wonderful to be here, and happy Women's Day, everybody. Uh, and I mean that for everybody who's here. Thank you all for joining. Um, when Meg uh, asked me to come speak, um, I wasn't actually quite sure what to talk about, because I don't really have um, presentations prepared for a Women's Day type of audience. I sort of talk about how we work as people um, and what kind of things we can do to bring balance into all of our lives. Uh, and so what I proposed was talking about um, what we've done and what I've seen as best practices to help people find that work-life balance, whatever it is that they're trying to do, uh, to make sure that they are getting the absolute best out of their work and their life, which is a tough balance. Um, so just to reintroduce myself. Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, my name is Jana Basto and I am the co-founder of Prodpad, which is a software tool for uh, product managers. Um, it's based in Brighton, well actually in Hove. Uh, so we've got a team based there as well as a few people spotted around uh, the rest of the UK and in Europe. Uh, and I'm also co-founder of Mind the Product, which is a series of events and a community for product managers all around the world. Uh, if you'd like to know more about that, um, I'll introduce my co-founder James, who's also oh, here right. today. Um, so uh, it'd be good to see some of you guys here. And I actually do reckon, uh, recognize some faces here, so thank you for joining. Um, now, the thing with work-life balance, you know, you see a lot of companies providing work-life balance in the form of you know, letting you come in late so you can hit that yoga class in the morning, or letting you go home early so you can tuck your kids in, or letting you take your, your work home on your phone so you can do it while watching Netflix at night because you took time off earlier to put the kids in bed, or whatever it is. Now the thing is that work-life balance isn't just a scheduling challenge, right? You don't just schedule in going, well, now is lifetime, and then in an hour I'm going to start work, and then after two hours I'm going to put work down and go do life again. What tends to happen is that if work isn't careful, it bleeds in to the rest of your life. Even if you're not at work, even if you're not doing work, even if you're on to lifetime, you're stressed out. It's, it's bleeding into your time. It's tr causing you to not be able to appreciate and, and balance your life out. Uh, and there's things that you can do to balance that out. And I think it comes down to the people who run workplaces. Um, it's not just about giving somebody time off to go spend time with their kids. It's about organizing the work that they do to make sure that it doesn't lead into their life and they can find that balance. Who here is a manager, a boss, a business owner, is in charge of managing other people's work? All right, so this is for you because this is what we can do for the people who work with us. First step, let's kill the deadline. Who here works to arbitrary deadlines because you seem to think that if you have a deadline, you'll get stuff done faster, or if you give your team deadlines, they'll actually focus on it and get things done. One of the problems with deadlines <clears throat> is that it just creates this unnecessary stress and actually causes worse work to come at the end of it. 
Um, so I'm going to give some examples on this. Um, if anybody is familiar with project management, you know the... <coughs> sorry, my voice. Um, you'll know the iron triangle of scope, time, and cost. You know, if you want something fast, then you know, you're not going to be able to get it cheap and good at the same time. You need to pick something and find that balance. If you do insist on setting the scope, as in saying, this is what is due, um, and setting the time, saying it is due on Friday, um, and setting the cost, which is, you know, it, we're using your time and not your time, for example. At that point in time, if you are forcing all that stuff, if anything goes wrong during the duration of that project, whether it's a minor task or a major project, the first thing that gets cut out is quality, because you're not willing to move on the time or the cost. And thank you very much, it's very concerned. <laughs> Um, and a lot of us tend to work like this. You've got this project plan, you've got this thing, list of things that you're going to do. Anybody have some sort of like Gantt chart or planning document outlining all the stuff they're going to do? Um, this is how so many people work. Um, even if they don't outline it like this, this is how they think they work, right? They're like, oh, I'm going to do these things, and once this one's done, I'm going to move on to this one, and once that team's done, we're going to move on to this one. And here's where this starts going wrong, because this is basically just a chart of things to do versus time. And it seems nice and simple at first when you start putting small things on there, especially the things that you've got a good handle on or people that you're working with, understand the scope of and can work to. And you start adding more things on there. But the more you add and the further out you go, the more hectic this becomes. And you end up stacking on all this work to do. And really what you're doing is making a whole bunch of assumptions of when something can be done. Um, so what you're actually doing with this is setting a whole bunch of due dates and durations, and by doing so, you are setting a fixed time, a fixed cost, and a fixed scope, which means that if anything slips, the first thing it goes is quality, and the first thing it goes in everyone's mind is tends to be additional stress. Um, and so you're stacking a whole bunch of assumptions on top as well. So the first assumption is that you are assuming you know how long each task is going to take, that you manage to suss out and, and estimate everything to a, a reasonable enough degree that you can say, if I give you this task, I can expect it back by Tuesday because that's how long something takes. That's one assumption. The other assumption is that nothing else is going to come in and disrupt this timeline. Uh, there's going to be no disruptions. No, one gonna, no one's going to be off sick. No one's going to need time for themselves. Uh, there's going to be no new opportunities or you know something that a competitor did or something that you saw on the market that you need to respond to. Don't want to exit full screen. There we go. Um, you're also assuming that each thing is going to work, that the task is going to be done and complete to your standard of quality the first time it is done, uh, which is a big assumption because oftentimes people need to try something out, get it wrong the first time, get some feedback on it, and then iterate on that. And you're also assuming that each of these things that you've laid out for everyone actually deserves to exist, that it was the right thing to say when you started planning it out a month ago, and therefore it's on the project plan, and therefore you must go do it. Uh, and it's sort of making this big assumption that nothing is going to change. And has ever, anybody ever worked on any sort of project or set of tasks, things change. So what goes wrong? Well, you get these made up release dates, you've got your team running towards these death marches to get these projects done on time. Uh, you've got mismanaged expectations, you've got customers or bosses or whoever else expecting something out when in fact it might not be coming out because something went wrong along the timeline. Um, oftentimes you end up missing stuff because you're so focused on doing what you thought was important maybe a month ago or six months ago, you don't actually look around to see what else could be done. Uh, and oftentimes you end up just doing the wrong things. Uh, anybody else felt this before, that they're trucking on and building work and realizing, why are we doing this? Right? There's some other opportunity over here. Which leads to us, all of us, having sad team members. Deadlines equals stress, and stress equals lower quality work, and it equals work leading into playtime. Uh, and oftentimes they're completely unnecessary. They're just there sometimes because the boss thinks that if they put a deadline, we're all gonna work that little bit faster, or we're gonna stick to our timelines and focus more. And that's been proven wrong time and time again. Now, sometimes it is important to work two deadlines. I'm hearing some of you going, well, the client's paid us to do it by here, so we have to have this done. <coughs> sometimes it is necessary, and it is important to know when those places are, because just because one thing has a deadline doesn't mean everything should be deadline-driven. This is a really key point. 
Um, there's some good examples of when you need deadlines. Like, uh, who remembers GDPR? <laughs> we'll never forget it, right? Uh, we all had a deadline on that. It was a series of deadlines, and it was hard work, and we had to work to it. That one was externally driven. It was um, regulatory driven. We could not get around that one. Um, who works in anything that's um, seasonal? You've got to get something out for Christmas time because you're in e-commerce or uh, in time for a school starting because you're in education or whatever else. There are some things that are strategically important to your company to not miss. That's fine. Make sure that you note those things. Make sure people understand what those deadlines are. And make sure that you're building in enough buffer time to work around that. But it doesn't mean that everything needs to be deadline driven. You don't need that stress. And you don't need to be artificially adding that in order to get stuff out the door because you're not getting as good a work out the door. And it's, it's, it's ruining people's lives. And it's bleeding into their, their lifetime. Um, so, so some bad reasons to have dates. Your bosses expect it. Um, you're putting dates on just because you always did it that way. Um, your planning format implies it, right? You've always worked from some planning document that kind of outlines things with a list of things to do versus time. Um, again, just because that's how you've always done it doesn't mean it's the right way. Um, and <laughs> this is kind of the pointy-haired boss version, is that you think it's going to focus the team and speed them up. Uh, but what it actually does, I mean, I see this with development teams all the time, uh, you'll ask them to get something out by next Friday. They're working through their sprint, they're, they're coding away. Uh, and if you say that the, the release has to include this, and it has to be out by Friday, if they start running into problems, what do you think happens? Well, they start missing out, not on the features that you see on the front end, because that's stuff they can get out there. They'll start missing out on good code commenting. They'll start missing out on uh, writing tests for their code. They'll start missing out on documenting stuff properly. You get tech debt. You get people building slightly subpar products or slightly subpar finished versions of what they're trying to do in order to hit these dates that their pointy-haired bosses asked for, which was just an arbitrary date anyways. Why Friday? If it took till Tuesday to make it that much better, so you didn't have to go back and fix it a year later, why not just give them till Tuesday? And so this is what I'm saying about removing deadlines and removing that stress from people's lives. Um, so just ask yourself, what is driving the need for the deadline? Is it something regulatory? Is it strategically important? Or is it something that you're just doing because that's what you think you need to do? Um, so take the deadlines off yourself, push back on them if anybody's giving you deadlines, and try not to give them to the people on your team. Trust them to build good product in the time that it takes them to do so. Uh, which takes me to my second point, which is to focus on outcomes. So if you're not focusing on getting output, like get this thing done by Tuesday, then what are you driving them towards? Um, now I've heard this fear that people say, well if I gave them unlimited time, work would fill to expand, would expand to fill that time. Which is true to a certain point, but there, there does come a point where you end up with really good, high quality stuff being put out there. And no, it doesn't expand infinitely. It's kind of like if you've got a, a lab who overeats. The best thing you can do for them is just give them as much food as they want, and eventually they learn that the food is not going away. They're not going to eat themselves until they eat a like, massive pile of it. They will find a happy stopping point and work from there. Um, your team will find a happy stopping point when you say, this is the quality I'm looking to get. Um, I want you guys to go find the best way of solving this, go do that. They won't work on it for six months when you when they originally thought it was going to take six weeks. They might take eight weeks, but what you get at the end of it is infinitely better than what you get at the six week mark. Um, so I see some problems with the way that companies are organized, and this goes up not, you know, based on what a lot of us work on. This is like the old school way of working where companies have siloed out these different areas. The sales team are measured by what's in their pipeline and what kind of revenue, what kind of, close, uh, what kind of deals are closing. Uh, the marketing team is measured on cost per lead and ROI and campaign costs. The development team is, they're actually a cost center in the business. They're not a profit center, they're a cost center. And so they're measured by things like their um, uh, story points and their velocity and their burn down charts. We've created these artificial measures of how development works so that we can put them in a box and see if they're going up or down. And what you actually get is not one cohesive team working towards one outcome. You end up with different teams, different department heads competing against each other to each get green ticks next to their name. Everyone's going up and to the right, but the company itself isn't necessarily solving the right problems, and it's certainly not best for the people who are working there. And so you end up with vanity metrics, right? The marketing team saying, yeah, we're awesome. It's up and to the right, so obviously this is good. 
uh, you end up with counterintuitive business decisions. Um, one team saying, well, I got my numbers up or down or whatever I was trying to do, but it might have some knock-on effect with somebody else's numbers. They're working against each other rather than together. Uh, and so there is a tactic that's being used by companies nowadays that is addressing this. Um, has anybody here heard of OKRs? Okay. All oh, right. Only from me. Okay. Um, this is in use by companies like Google and a lot of the other tech companies and a lot of firms now. Um, a lot of people attribute it to Google, but actually it existed before them. They just popularized it. Um, in the old days, you might have known these as KPIs. And the only reason KPIs didn't work is because we took them out of context, siloed them, and then did a bad job of them. OKRs are not that much different, but there is a key differentiation, which is that it's designed to give alignment and autonomy to your team so they can work towards the right stuff. So OKRs stands for objectives and key results. So two sides of the same coin. So, objectives are meant to be set at the company level, right? The, the, the company should be able to say, this is our vision, this is where we want to go, uh, and these are the, the North Star metrics, right? We want to get revenue up, we want to hit this sort of thing, we want to get user, we want to own the market and take over 20%. Whatever it is, they need to be able to set some sort of high level, aspirational, challenging, and vision aligned goals. And these objectives each have their own set of key results. And the key thing is here is that the objectives are set by the company level, and then each team or department head sets their own objectives as to how they're going to contribute to that. So the marketing team will say, well, we're going to do this. We're going to get um, you know, this many leads or whatever else. The sales team will say, we're going to do this. The development team will say, we're going to do this. And they all talk about how they're going to contribute to that. And then individuals and teams within there set their own key results, which is how you're going to measure it. They're the things that you're going to do in order to hit those objectives. Um, and so typically the objectives are long-term things, you're measuring these out by years. Um, the key results are typically monthly or quarterly type things, uh, and they're quantifiable, they're measurable. You will be able to measure and know if you've done them. But you are supposed to set them at quite an um, aspirational level, as in you're not supposed to set something that, oh, I can easily call 10 leads tomorrow or in this next week. Say, well actually, I usually call 10, I'm going to set it to 15. But the key thing is, is that it's me setting my own goals. It is me betting against myself what I can get. And if I get that wrong as a team player, it's my pointy hair boss is not going to be yelling at me. We actually expect to hit maybe 60 to 80 percent, and that's good. Um, no one's expecting to do all your key results. You're setting them yourself as an aspiration of what kind of things you think are, you're going to be able to do to contribute to the company's success. Um, but you're not using it as a, um, as a stick to measure people by going, well, you said you'd call 20 customers and you only called 15, so I'm going to dock you, you know, 20%. That's not how it works. So the whole point here is that the objectives set alignment. They're basically saying, this is where we want to go. These are the things that we're measured by. Each of you in the team, you're really smart in your particular area, you're trained, you know the space better than us, and you know what you're capable of. So the key results allow me to allow each person on the team to say, well, I'm going to contribute this and this and this, and that's what I'm going to do this month, and then I'm going to check it off by the end of the month, and then try to beat that next month. And we're going to compare results, we're going to share results, uh, but we're not going to uh, beat ourselves up if we don't hit it, we're just going to learn from it and turn it back around and, and do it again. And the key thing is that a great company, in order to work uh, effectively, and in order to work effectively and give their team that work-life balance, that, that you know, deadline-free but still productivity, uh, needs to have high autonomy, people understanding that they can find their own route forwards on things, and high alignment. They need to know where it is that they're going. If you lack one of those things, you either end up in a situation where you've got this chaotic culture where no one's telling you where to go when everyone's working on whatever they want. A lot of startups work this way. Um, or this is sort of the, the typical way you think of management where you've got some boss saying, well, we're going to do this. These are your KPIs. You go do this. You go do this. You go do this. And you tell me uh, what your numbers are. And you're in trouble if you don't get them. So we're aiming for this high alignment, high autonomy thing. And objectives and key results can come into that.
Now there's a million ways to cut OKRs, so I'm not going to go into those details. Um, there's so much further reading you can find if you just look up OKRs, lots of books, lots of information on them. And I'm happy to answer questions because uh, it's a constant learning thing for every company who grapples with them. Uh, and a small bonus one, um, tidy up time. And this is something that I implemented in my company at Broadpad. Um, has anybody read uh, David Allen's Getting Things Done book? It's kind of like an old school um, productivity book. And there's a few rules in there that some people might have heard of over the years. Like the one of never look at an email twice. Um, always either file it or do something with it. Never let your inbox pile up. If you can do something in less than two minutes, do it. If it takes more than that, put it in a pile to be done so that you know to come back to it. So some really interesting stuff in there. But one of the um, suggestions that he has is sort of this list of this pile of things and you can think about it as your you know mailbox piling up you've been spending all week working on the things that are important but there's always things that are left over and he recommends taking your sunday afternoon out and grooming this backlog and going through it uh, and for years i tried to do this I, I i fall off the wagon often enough but get back on when i can um, no one does it perfectly even david allen himself but the whole point is that you spend some time every at least once a month going through and getting back down to inbox zero getting back down to a state so that you can think more creatively because people can't think creatively they can't allow they can't live if their work is still just stacked up kind of lurking in the corner there and we all have that when we've got our phones out and it's got 300 unread messages or whatever else is happening um, and so tidy up time was basically uh, taking this concept of the Sunday afternoon, but I realized I couldn't ask my team to take their Sunday afternoon to tidy stuff up. Uh, so what we do is we give them two hours every Friday. So if you're, if you're typically going to finish at five o'clock, instead put down your work at three o'clock. Stop coding, stop writing copy, stop doing what you do for your job, and just spend the next couple hours tidying up just the stuff around you. And this could mean something as simple as cleaning your desk so that when you come in on Monday, you don't have clutter. It could be filing your um, inbox. It could be installing some programs and doing some upgrades. It could be exploring some new program that's going to make you faster next week. What we were doing is just giving people permission to do the work that needs to happen so you can do your work. And so often, people are judged by how many lines of code they put out, or how many um, ads they write, or how many blogs they put out, or whatever else, which is your core job. But you can't do that job unless you, you can't do that job creatively and effectively if you have all this stuff kind of piled up, freaking you out and stressing you out, and causing people to work overtime, or take over the weekends, or take over their lifetime, because they don't have uh, that space to do so. So we built that directly into the team itself, built that into the schedule, and we celebrate it. When tidy up time comes, we all jump onto Slack and say, this is what I'm doing for my tidy time. What are you guys doing? And then we, we shut up and we work on our tidy time and try to get things tidied up so we can be creative and productive the following week. And so that is how you can achieve work-life balance by focusing on the work part. And that's not to say that the life part isn't important, but definitely focus on how you can make work better so it doesn't bleed into the life part. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to answer questions or follow your lead, really. Questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've blown them away. <laughs> yeah, Jenna, yes. have you ever seen the picture of the former CEO of Chrysler with, with a desk in a total mess? Oh. Uh, and the caption on it was, God bless this mess. Yep. I know where everything is. Yes. And you know what? I absolutely can level with that. Uh, they say that messy people are more creative and more productive, which, hey, I'm a messy person. Um, and I can absolutely level with that. But the key thing is that they know where everything is. And the only way that you know where everything is is by mentally being able to go through or physically going through and grooming that list, that, that pile of stuff you have, and knowing where the things are. So we're not saying you have to have a clean desk. Um, I'm not saying how you need to organize your inbox. It can be colorful and have a million tags, or you get one of those inbox zero people who get an email and miraculously it disappears because you've actually did it instantly. I'm not going to judge how you organize it, but it is just making sure that you've got your mind wrapped around it and you're giving yourself space just to understand what that big pile of mess is. And that's okay. So the Chrysler guy was probably doing some of this stuff um, uh, innately anyways.
If you're deadline driven, and that's how you've worked for years and years and years yep. and whatever, how would you suggest changing that, changing that up and, and changing the process a little bit? And yes. because it can't happen straight away because you know there'll be stress involved. Yeah. Um, you know, what what would be your recommendation? That's a really good question. Um, question back to you. Do you mean if you your organization is deadline driven by nature, or you as a person is? Both, I guess. Both. Okay. If you as a person are driven. Um, by deadlines. Cool. Embrace that. Um, I am not. I'm a procrastinator. Um, the only thing a deadline does is tell me when I can start, which is the day before. Um, <laughs> so I don't find it particularly helpful. Other people love having deadlines and they work for that. I like to think of them as more of like goals, right? Like me personally, I think that I can get this out by Tuesday. If it comes out on Wednesday, fine. Like I can slap myself on the wrist if I want to. But the key thing is, is that it's me slapping myself on the wrist for procrastinating or not. Um, I can find ways to reward myself or slap myself on the wrist for that. But it's not my boss doing so because Tuesday was some magic day that this yes. thing had to come out. If the company is deadline driven, this changes things. Because some companies are, um, you can think about some companies as being uh, product driven and other ones being like deadline driven. And one of the problems with being a deadline driven company um, is uh, a classic example is an agency who takes money and puts their people onto things and then does stuff and sells that stuff, right? This is basically the classic way that companies work. The only way they're able to do that is by, um, if they're successful in any sense, is by raising the price and adding buffer and making sure there's plenty of time in there. So if you find that your company is deadline driven and everyone keeps missing their deadlines, you're not charging enough and you're not um, uh, giving enough time to it, you're not buffering it out enough. It shouldn't be stressing at your team to do so. If it is, then it's not a sustainable business. Um, one of the other things I see is people say, well, I have to set my prices low and set the deadlines closer because if I don't, then somebody else is gonna beat me on that thing. Don't do that, that's how we get in a race to the bottom and everyone ends up saying, oh, well, I can make your website be perfect by Tuesday and I'll do it for $100 and then the next person says, I'll do it for 75 and I'll have it by Monday and the work just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, instead, sell yourself on the quality that you provide. You're starting to see agencies turn around saying, you know, we're not going to say that we're going to have your, your thing fixed by Tuesday. We're, we've, what we promise is that we're going to do, um, you know, at least 10 sets of research by these six weeks is up and we're going to have these prototypes out. We're going to show you how this improves. And then at the end of six weeks, we'll talk about whether you want to take us on for the next six weeks to improve it further. Um, and so you can actually sell your, 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 your time based on that. Uh, the key thing is, is with, as to whether you are selling value to the clients or whether you're selling just your time. And if you are selling just your time, then you're selling your people's time. And you need to, need to respect that and make sure that you're adding in plenty of time, because whatever their buffers are, you're going to have to add to as well, because your timeline will change, things will screw up, and it shouldn't come down on the heads of people working in the company for somebody's bad decision selling something that they maybe shouldn't have. Uh, it is a tough one to grapple with. Thank you. Of course. Great.